Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, I guess we're on. All right, it's good to see everybody here again this afternoon, and uh, it's uh, been a month since we've seen a lot of you folks, and so it is always good to come back and uh, have this afternoon of uh, not only Bible teaching, but just plain good fellowship and uh, a time together. For those of you out in television, if you ever happen to be coming this way in the first week of the month on Wednesday, well, you just call us and uh, we'll help you find your way into uh, the studios here. And again, we like to thank our television audience for your letters, your prayers, my, our, as I've said over and over, our mail time is getting more thrilling, I think, all the time. The other day, and I have to share this with my whole nationwide on, the other day, five phone calls in a row were all from men. Men are responding to our teaching, I think, far more than anybody else. And they all say the same thing. Never had an interest before. A lot of them will say, I never even went to church. But I caught your program, and it has totally changed my life. And so that's the kind of responses we're getting, and uh, particularly from the men. I had a couple again this forenoon uh, before we left home. Men, uh, that, that's pretty unusual, I think. So we do. We just praise the Lord, and for you gentlemen out there, we just say keep it up. And uh, keep sharing the Word as you learn it. Okay, I think we're ready to get back into our study of the but nows, but God, whatever the case may be. And this will be the final four programs of book number 64, for those of you who like to order them. And uh, that will give the girls the understanding of which one you want. Book 64 will cover today's program. All right, Matthew chapter 6. And uh, now, of course, we're up in Christ's earthly ministry. If you have a red letter edition, this is just about all red, the whole page. And so this is all the words of Christ during his earthly ministry. And as I have stressed over and over and over, that Jesus always spoke only to the Jew, with two exceptions, under the law, and with no indication of going to the Gentiles with what we call the gospel of grace. It's just not in here. So be aware of that as we study the words of the Lord Jesus himself. All right, now Matthew chapter 6, the verse that we want to find the but seek is verse 33. But let's go back and see how Jesus builds up to that statement. All right, let's go all the way back to uh, verse 28. You can just about jump in on any of these because they're all dealing with the same thing. Matthew 6, verse 28, Jesus says to his listeners now who are Jews, Why take thought for raiment, or what you wear? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these lilies. So wherefore, if God can so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, or it just disappears, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now if you know how to read, what does that statement right there tell you? He's talking to Jews. And he's using Gentiles as an outside example. See? Now the casual reader will just go right through that and never recognize but see, he's talking to Jews, and he's using those outside Gentiles as an example of how they are not to be. So he said, don't be like those Gentiles. Be different. All right? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father... Now, the Gentiles couldn't say that. The Gentiles didn't call God their father. The only gods they had were the idols and the pagan mythological gods and goddesses. They didn't know the God of the Bible. And so this all points this out, see? All right, so 
Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but, now here it comes, here's what we're building up to, here's the flip side, but instead of being all concerned about earthly and material and physical things, seek you first, not only, you can't just live on spiritual things in this old world. You still have to work. You still have to make a living. You have to provide for your family. We're going to show all this in just a minute. But the order of priorities is what we're talking about. Your first priority, Jesus said, should be to seek the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I don't know how long I'll be on this, but it'll be a while. You know, you hear so much today, we've got to fill up the kingdom. We've got to work for the kingdom. Well, that's all okay up to a point. But you see, that's not, again, our number one priority, is the kingdom of God as Jesus is presenting it to Israel. Now, I think most of you, and most of you even in, out in, my, in my television audience, realize that you've got two references to kingdoms. One is the kingdom of heaven, and the other one is the kingdom of God. And I get question after question, so I know that people are concerned about it. Are they both the same, or are they different? What's the deal? Why do we hear the kingdom of heaven on one hand, and the kingdom of God on the other? Well, if I'd a thought I was going to bring a chalk with a string on it so I could draw a nice circle on the board, but since I didn't, I'm not going to, so you'll have to picture them in your mind. Just draw one large circle on your notepad, and we'll call that the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is that whole sphere of God's sovereignty over which He is in total control, which would include the heavens, the angelic hosts, all believers from day one until the end. Anytime you and I talk about things concerning the Word of God, it's concerning the kingdom of God because it's under His sovereign grace and control. And so anytime that we have anything spiritual, it pertains to the kingdom of God. It's that area where He is in intrinsic sovereign control. Now, on the other hand, the kingdom of heaven is in that circle that you've now labeled the kingdom of God. And so, just draw another circle inside the big one. And here you have the kingdom of heaven. And then you can put a third circle over there, and we're going to come to that after a while, called the body of Christ. Now, it's the body that you and I should be concerned about today in getting it filled up. Not the kingdom, necessarily. We're never going to get that filled anyway. But we can work toward the filling of the body of Christ, which is in the kingdom of God. It's part of God's domain. Of course it is. But all right. Now, in order to designate the, the kingdom of heaven, as we see it almost entirely in Matthew, and how that the kingdom of heaven can sometimes be referred to as the kingdom of God. Because it is. It's within that sphere of God's influence. In fact, let me give you an example right here. Keep your hand in Matthew and go to Acts, honey. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And I think this can probably explain it as well as anything. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I've got to remind myself to wait until you find it, because again, the other day, I had an elderly gentleman call, and he said, thank you for giving me time to find the scriptures that you give. Don't go so fast that we can't find them. So bear with me as we try to slow up. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Now, this is the Lord Jesus meeting with the eleven after his resurrection, and at the end of the 40 days of his being with the 11, until he will ascend back to glory. All right, so in this 40-day period, verse 3, to whom also the 11, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, that is the 11 in particular, 
40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. But all right, what kingdom were the 12 or the 11 here, what were they really interested in? The earthly kingdom of heaven that Christ was one day going to set up. All right, so here I think the kingdom of God is a direct reference to the earthly kingdom of heaven, even though it's called the kingdom of God. Now, why do I think so? Go on over to verse 6. Verse 6 in this same chapter. When they therefore were come together, that is, Jesus and the eleven, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, what kingdom are they talking about? The earthly kingdom. That earthly kingdom that's been promised ever since, you might say, the call of Abraham, that the day would come when God the Son, the Messiah of Israel, would return to the planet and establish his throne room in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and he would rule over an earthly authoritarian kingdom. Now, I know that most of Christendom is just blank on this. I had a lady call from Texas yesterday, and she's been in one of our major denominations, I suppose, most of her life. And she said, Les, why? Why haven't we been taught this before? She said, I never heard of such a thing until I started watching your program. Well, I said, you're not alone. That's most of church people. But see, this is a whole biblical concept that everything is moving to the day when Christ will return, not just to end everything, but to establish an earthly kingdom with flesh and blood people, with animals, kids, children, homes. Then it's going to be like heaven because Satan is off and there's no sin, no death, and it's going to be a glorious earthly kingdom. Now that's the kingdom of heaven. It's in the kingdom of God because it's in God's sovereignty. Of course it is. And so here is a good example that if you see the term, the kingdom of God, look at it in the text in which it's located. Is it talking about the earthly kingdom or is it talking about that invisible sphere of God's influence? And it's not that hard to do. This is a good example. All right, now then let's go back to the Old Testament and let's just see how the concept of this earthly kingdom begins to unfold. Go back first with me to Daniel chapter 2. And I'm going to take my time on this because, like I said, we get so many questions from our television audience about these two kingdoms. And there is so little understanding amongst Christendom of this earthly kingdom over which Christ will rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But the Old Testament is full of it. That's what Israel was looking for if they had any understanding of Scripture at all. Daniel chapter 2, and uh, I might as well start at verse 31. I might as well share with my television audience what I shared with the studio audience. I was contemplating winding up my producing programs with this program. And uh, since it's at the end of a book, it'd be a good time to stop. And uh, then I mentioned to a few people, and uh, they just said, no way. So now I've decided we'll keep on going for a while longer, because after all, I'm not getting any younger, and all of you out in television know that. But uh, anyway, now I'm not going to be in a big sweat. See, I was trying to wind everything up by the end of this afternoon, but uh, we'll keep going for a while. Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 31. And he's addressing King Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. And Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, sawest, behold, a great image, or a likeness. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, or frightening, or terrifying, stood before thee, and the form thereof was frightening. Now, you've got to use a little imagination. Nebuchadnezzar sees a huge likeness of a man, probably a military type. All right, and now he says in verse 32, 
This image's head was of fine gold. His breast, his shoulder area, and his arms were of silver. His belly, or his torso, and the thighs were brass. His legs of iron, and his feet, part iron and part clay. Now, do you got the picture? We've done this in prophecy more than once. Here, Nebuchadnezzar sees this humongous statue in the likeness of, like I say, probably a military figure, with a head of gold, a chest of silver, a belly of brass, legs of iron, but feet of iron and clay. And there it stood. Now we know from the rest of Scripture that that was a prophetic preview of the Gentile empires that would be coming down history's pipe, starting with Nebuchadnezzar in 606 B.C., because the Babylonian Empire was the first. And then came the Medes and the Persians. Then they were overrun by the Greeks. And the Greeks, in turn, were defeated by the Romans. And so here are the four empires, prophetically speaking, and then the feet of iron and clay would be what we're seeing in Europe tonight, or today, a revived Roman Empire. And as you can tell already from the news, how those European nations just have a hard time getting along, along because of all their differences, their ethnic background, their religious differences. And so they've come together, thought last week they were going to have a new constitution, but it's kind of been set back for a while. But nevertheless, it's a revived Roman Empire. And that's the feet of iron and clay. All right, now here we have Gentile history coming down from 606 B.C. up to the time of Christ and beyond when the Roman Empire disappeared. But now, 1900 years later, here it comes back on the scene in the form of the European community. All right, now then let's go on. Verse 34. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that in his dream you saw this huge image standing there in front of you until, and I always use that word as a point in time, there would come a point in time when this whole preview of human history will come to an end. And we're getting there. My, we're getting there. Closer and closer. All right, now look what happens that a stone cut out without hands. Now, there's only one power in earth that can perform something without the use of human hands. Whose power is that? Well, God's power. And who is the stone in all of Scripture? Jesus Christ. All right, so here we have, prophetically speaking then, the coming of Jesus Christ, who is going to literally crush every vestige of these Gentile empires. All right, read on. So this stone was cut out without hands, and it smote the image upon his feet. Now, we taught this all years back, but I'm going to teach it <laughs> meticulously again. Why does the stone strike the feet? Because that's the empire that will be operating at his second coming. The European community is coming up, coming up. In fact, somebody wrote and asked me the other day about the euro dollar. And she said, you said something about it years ago. And I said, you better do. And if I wanted to get a little proud, I could say, see, I told you so. But I'm not going to do that. But way back when we were te teaching Revelation and they were still talking about a euro dollar, it hadn't happened yet, I made the statement, now you wait and see, the day will come when it'll go right on by in value, the American dollar, which is the benchmark for all of world currencies. I think you all know that much about the, the markets. Every currency in the world is registered according to the dollar. Well, you see, when they first introduced the euro dollar, a couple years ago now, it started out like 80 cents to a dollar. In other words, if you had a euro dollar, it was only worth 80 cents. Right now, the euro dollar is, the last I read, is $1.39. So what has it done? It's gone right by the dollar in value. Now, I'm not saying it'll stay there. It may drop back. But nevertheless, the European community is being set 
to be the final Gentile empire. Not America, Europe. Now, I read a book the other night where there's a lot of speculation. Why is America never mentioned in prophecy? And this guy agreed with me. You can't find it. There's not even a hint of the Western Hemisphere in biblical prophecy. So that being the case, something is going to have to happen to America so that Europe can be the primary power that the Antichrist can use. Well, now this guy he thought of something that I hadn't even considered before, and he said it'll be the rapture. And here was his thinking. America has got by far, far more people who will be taken out in the rapture than any other area of the world. And that's not hard to believe. All right, now then he used two different poll figures. One poll, I think, was by Barna, who is quite reliable. And he comes up with a figure that there are probably around 50 million truly born-again Christians in America today. I think he's high, but we're not going to argue. The other fellow, I don't remember who that was, he came up with where I would come closer, that it's somewhere between 25 and 30 million, that if the Lord would come, they'd be gone. So this author said, even if you take the lowest figure, can you imagine what would happen to America's economy if all of a sudden 30 million of us are gone from all walks of life? from the business world, all the house payments that will not be paid, all the car payments that will go defunct. It would devastate our economy in a week's time. And now I don't have to draw you the picture. If our economy should crash down to where it was in the 30s, with our young people as spoiled as they are, what will be the end result? total revolution. It'll be a total destruction. Now, I'm not a pessimist. Ah, you all know I'm, I'm an optimist if there ever was one. But I can still see that prophetically this something like this is going to happen to bring America down to nothing so that Europe can be the primary power. It has to be. It has to be. And uh, as we pointed out on our seminar in Tulsa here a few weeks ago, Iraq is not in that list of nations that will invade Israel and be destroyed. Why? Well, God evidently has something special in his program for the little nation of Iraq in the end time that they will not be destroyed with the rest of those Muslim nations in Ezekiel 38, which will be in the early part of the tribulation. So there's something special. And I made the point then. This is probably why America and England were led to go in and do what we've done in Iraq. It seems hopeless right now, but I'll just guarantee it that over time, Iraq is going to come out and blossom and be the main player in the Middle East. It may take a while, but that is what I think is in God's program. All right, now i only got a couple minutes left, so we better get back to our text. Daniel chapter 2. So the second coming of Christ will strike the empire that is visible and operating at that time, which will be the revived Roman Empire coming out of Europe in the Mediterranean area. All right, now as that stone symbolically now, now remember this is in symbolism, but it's a literal fact that as that stone strikes the feet, the revived Roman Empire it's going to go right on and it's going to crush the iron and the clay and then it will go on to the brass in verse 35, the legs and then the brass, the silver, the gold. In other words, that whole consortium of Gentile empires that, by the way, are back on the scene again right now today. Iran is ancient Syria. Uh, Persia, Syria is in the news every day, and the Greek Empire is more or less indicated with some of these other Muslim nations, and then we've got, like I said, the revived Roman Empire and then the Babylonian. So all of these empires are right back in every day's news again today. All right, so for the second coming of Christ then, 
they will all be lined up and they will be destroyed one right after the other. All right, so he says, the uh, verse 34, reading it again, you saw till a stone cut out without hands, that's the second coming of Christ, smites the image upon his feet, the revived Roman Empire, made of iron and clay and broken to pieces. Now verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, that's all the way up now to the Greek Empire, the silver, the Mede Empire, and the gold, the ancient Babylonian Empire, they are all broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And what is chaff? It just blows away and disappears, all right? And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And now here is the culmination of it all, the stone, Christ, in his second coming. The stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and the word mountain in our Old Testament is a kingdom. So Christ sets up a kingdom, see? And that filled the whole earth, not just Israel, the whole earth. All right, now flip over a couple pages to chapter 7, and we've got Daniel now having his own vision of the same scenario, but instead of having metals, he has carnivorous animals. But the end result is the same, that after all these empires have been destroyed, now I want to come down quickly to Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, because all I'm trying to establish is that there is coming an earthly kingdom over which Christ will rule and reign. All right, verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, and Son is capitalized. And he came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. He comes before the Father. And they brought him near before him, and there was given to him the Son, a dominion and glory and a kingdom, a kingdom in which all people and nations and languages should serve him. Now look at the rest of the verse. His dominion, his rule, his kingship, which shall not, or it's an everlasting dominion, shall not pass away, and his kingdom oh, is going to be one that shall never be destroyed. Now the Old Testament doesn't give us a time frame like the New Testament does, but it's going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.